This program is being presented to you by the Horaeus International Winter School on Gravity and Light. Well, thanks Frederick and Cora for inviting me. So this is an evening le lecture on, on the difficult relation between quantum theory in general and, um, and gravity. And as you might know, there is no, no consistent theory of quantum gravity, and it's not even unanimously shared in opinion that there should be one. And um, I give you some reasons along the lines of uh, this talk. So since this is an evening lecture, I sort of um, uh, erased um, some of the more technical parts and tried to convey some ideas. There will be, of course, formulae, but um, uh, I think the emphasis should be really on the ideas um, that lie between somewhere quantum theory and gravity. So let me start by, by a famous drawing. It's called the Bronstein cube, um, which is often given in this context, which is a cube that has, um, lies in the corner of a three-dimensional coordinate system, and each axis has a natural constant uh, to it, which is the, the Planck's constant, um, Newton's constant g, and the inverse velocity of light. And in a very, very rough sense, and I'm not saying this is, this is a, 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 very, a very useful picture, it's, uh, in, as a rough picture it's quite useful, you can understand the, the fundamental theories that we, that we have by kind of um, uh, supposing that um, you switch on these, these, these constants from the zero value on to some finite value. So in some sense, from classical mechanics, um, uh, you get to, not uniquely, but you, you get to quantum mechanics by switching on H. There is an there underlying mathematical theory called deformation theory, deformation quantization, um, uh, which kind of makes it mathematically precise how to go along this way, how to deform the Poisson algebra of observables in the classical theory to the um, algebra of observables in quantum theory. Likewise, if you go from classical mechanics to special relativity, this somehow corresponds to deforming uh, Galilei invariance. So from the Galilei group, you can actually get in a systematic fashion to the Poincaré group by um, deforming it. The converse is called contraction. So there is a deformation of the invariance group of classical mechanics to the invariance group of special relativity. And that has to do with switching on 1 over c. So give c a finite value rather than an infinite value. And the third axis is switching on gravity. There is no deformation theory that gets you from Newtonian uh, gravity to general relativity, except perhaps that in a very, very um, intuitive way, space-time gets deformed and acquires curvature. But there's no deformation of theories, really. In any way, so it's, I think the, the, the idea should be clear that somehow within this cube, several theories can be more or less uniquely um, uh, uh, located. So I don't want to, want to um, suggest that these, way, these, these different paths are always commutative. It's not clear that from classical mechanics you get a quantum mechanics by switching on H, and then you switch on 1 over C, and then you get to relativistic quantum field theory. Whereas, it would you, uh, I'm not saying that it's the same as first going to special relativity and then somehow applying some quantization rules, right? And so the, 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 the last missing part is that, is that, um, is that uh, corner here, and that stands for quantum gravity. So all three things are switched on, in a sense. And again, I want to emphasize that it is not obvious that you get to this um, hypothetical point in any order of following these edges. Perhaps there is no point at all. Perhaps you get into completely different kinds of physics by following these directions. Um, we don't know. And for most of my talk, I will be kind of be sitting somewhere close to quantum mechanics and trying to go, to go up this, in, in this direction. So quantum mechanics plus a little bit of gravity, whatever this means at the moment. Just the, so it can mean quantum mechanical systems in a gravitational field. You just drop quantum mechanical system or it can mean quantum mechanics as the source of gravitational fields. And um, you will see this more concretely as I go along. Um, the, the, the numbers that, that are floating around in the literature, if people talk about quantum gravity, are always the Planck units. 
So these are units of length, time and mass that you can form from these three constants that I've just shown you, h, bar, g and c. And they correspond to incredibly small distances, incredibly small times and not so small masses. Uh, it's not so small masses. So it's 10 to the minus 5 grams or 10 to the 19 atomic mass units. Atomic mass units is the weight of a proton. Or, and, and not the weight, the, the mass of a proton. And you can motivate why these, at, at least at these sort of, these, these, in, in these, um, at these scales, quantum gravity somehow must become important. For example, you could envisage um, a black hole whose mass is less than the Planck mass. If a black hole has a mass that is less than the Planck length, uh, the, the Planck mass, then uh, its diameter, its, its horizon diameter is less than its Compton wavelength. Now a Compton wavelength is a distance below which you can not really talk about classical distances. You, the resolution is not there to actually resolve distances smaller than this. So if you, if you say that operationally speaking distances smaller than the Compton wavelength should not be used on a classical level, then you would not say that a black hole exists beyond this mass because then you would have said that the horizon length is smaller than the Compton wavelength, which presumably is meaningless. So if somebody told you that he has produced a black hole smaller than the mass of the Planck mass, you should be suspicious because probably it doesn't make any sense. Um, and the smallness of these two numbers are the sort of the, the, are the, 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 the uh, embarrass are the embarrassment of those people who search for quantum gravity because you, 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 can, you can quite justifiably ask how would you ever ever get to distances at, at this length or times at this small time? How can you beat the Planck scale? Whoever talks about quantum gravity <coughs> should answer the question how he or she supposes to actually beat these, um, these ludicrously small, small scales. But as concerns the relation between quantum mechanics and relativity, it's not clear that this is the final word. It's not clear that you have to go to these, to these scales. It's a kind of sufficient condition. So if you add these clades, then probably um, some theory of quantum gravity should take over. But um, it's, the, the converse does not hold. So the converse saying, um, presumably you can see um, interesting effects that have to do with quantum theory and gravity uh, even before you reach these scales. So what is known actually about um, the relation between uh, gravity and quantum mechanics? And the answer is very, very little. Um, here is uh, two classic um, uh, experiments. One is the uh, famous Colella overhauser werner uh, experiment from 1975 uh, in which you have two beams of neutrons, very, very cold neutrons, and they are diffracted in a crystal, and um, it's a typical, interf uh, it's a typical um, uh, in interference experiment where a particle, um, uh, the, the quantum mechanical wave function of a particle gets coherently split and travel along two different paths and then being coherently combined. And the, the, the idea being that one of these paths uh, runs in a different gravitational potential than the other one, for example, at a different height, and then they are combined again. And the phase shift that you observe at the end via the diffraction uh, pattern uh, depends on this gravitational, on this difference of the gravitational potential. And so you can see the interaction between the gravitational field and a quantum mechanical delocalized particle, it's coherently split, by the diffraction pattern. And what has been tested by this experiment, what has been tested is the most obvious thing that anybody would write down, namely in the Schrodinger equation, an interaction term that consists of the gravitational <coughs> potential, the potential according to the gravitational interaction, times the wave function, just like any other potential in the Schrodinger equation. So what you see here as a diffraction pattern is just, a, just verifies that this is the right coupling. So this coupling has been verified in this experiment. And it's quite old, as you can see. So it's 40 years old. More recent, people um, took very cold, ultra-cold neutrons and produced bound states in the gravitational field of the Earth. So consider a hard mirror and, and um, neutrons bouncing on top of this hard mirror. And since um, on the, on the um, 
in the vertical direction, there is the gravitational pull. If you make the neutron very, very cold, it stays in a, in a, in a bound state between a potential that has a hard wall and a, linear, and a linear slope on the other side. And this is known from elementary quantum mechanics um, exercises, for example. It's the airy function that solves these, these um, uh, uh, bound states. And um, these bound states in the gravitational field, not in electric field, in the gravitational field have been seen and they are separated by the order of picoelectron volts. So it's very, very small, very, very small steps. And they have been produced at the Institut um, Langevin in Geneva. And um, I will come back to this experiment uh, later on. And again, what you see is just what you get if you put the Earth's gravitation potential into the Schrodinger equation in the obvious way. So there seems to be no problem at this point. It's the obvious coupling, and that has been verified. Okay. Um, as the, the, regarding the question whether quantum uh, gravity should be, um, should be pursued, I guess 90% of the people in the community would say a strong yes, of course you should, and there are strong candidates, um, not entirely satisfactory in all aspects, but there's string theory, loop quantum gravity, and other approaches. But there are also voices of people who actually pursue the, the, the game of quantum gravity, who sometimes ask the question, is quantum gravity really necessary? And is there perhaps an experiment by which we can test that it is necessary? Or is there perhaps an experiment in which you can test that it is not necessary? And that is what this, this paper is about, it's from 2008. And in this paper it is suggested that certain experiments in uh, molecular interferometry might show that quantum, um, that's, uh, the, quantum uh, the, the gravitational field has to stay classical rather than being quantized. And it's, um, it, it is suggested in this paper by a theorist that perhaps one should look at these uh, interesting experiments. And I will come back to this. This had, um, um, has been picked up by other people and I will um, tell you what the idea behind this proposal is. Um, and then the last um, sort of opinion I want to, I want to uh, display is a, a fairly recent paper by Roger Penrose um, who, who always took the point of view said, why, why do we always talk about quantizing relativity? I mean, it's always you take a classical theory and then you do something with it. You, uh, it, it undergoes a certain mathematical procedure and it becomes a quantum so-and-so theory. So quantum mechanics, quantum chromodynamics, quantum electrodynamics, and quantum gravity. Perhaps the union of the two will be such that um, the idea of quantum theory is at least as much changed as gravity will be changed. And so he says, why, so why give quantum theory pride of place in this proposed union? Perhaps we should gravitize quantum theory. Uh, whatever this means, it's um, kind of many meanings. Right, so let's, let's go a little bit into the, the foundations of, of our theory of gravity. And I understand that you have learned all the, the, sort of the, the, the formal stuff and the, the, the mathematics, and um, in this talk I will um, focus a little bit on the sort of um, conceptual backgrounds. And the conceptual background between, uh, be behind uh, uh, general additivity is the um, uh, famous equivalence principle, which has many formulations. Einstein himself changed this formulation many times, um, but the, the canonical way to present it nowadays is in a, um, is in a form in which it contains three more or less independent parts. <coughs> the, the first part is, is presumably that that you all associate with the um, um, equivalence principle. It's the universality of free fall, or sometimes expressed the equality of inertial and gravitational mass. And um, it's called UF, so universality of free fall. And it says that test bodies, and I put it in... in um, quotation marks, um, for reasons that I, I talk about later. So test bodies determine a so-called, and, and that's a mathematical expression now, a path structure. That means um, you have all learned about space-time manifolds and so on. So if you take a point and a direction on the space-time manifold, then this uniquely determines a path. And that is the path, a force-free particle, an otherwise force-free particle, just interacting gravitationally will follow on your space-time manifold. And that's 
in, in GR, for example, it's the geodesic equation. The geodesic equation needs a point in the direction. And once you have a point in the direction, there's a unique geodesic following uh, um, this, this, di this direction. Um, the universality of free fall says that there is something in the world called test particles, which has virtually no interaction with the outside world except for gravitational interaction, which is a problematic statement as such, but take it for granted for the moment. And it says these test bodies determine a path structure. So whenever you take one of these free particles and you throw it in a certain direction, then no matter which, which of the free particles you took, they all follow the same trajectory. And um, that's the statement of, of um, uh, uh, universality of free fall. And the path structure then has to be, in order to, ex in an axiomatic way, to arrive at general relativity, you then have to, to um, conclude, or you have to justify, that this path structure is actually the geodesic structure of a metric. It could be something more general. It could be the geodesic of a Finslerian metric, for example, more general than Riemannian metrics or pseudo-Riemannian metrics. And that is not so easy to argue, and that is not contained in the universality of free fall. The universality of free fall just says it's any, any path structure. Now, violations to this principle are usually operationally um, <coughs> encoded in what's called the Ötvesch factor, after the Baron Ötvesch and Hungarian physicists at the turn of the uh, um, 19th to 20th century, who made experiments with torsion balances probing the equality of um, uh, gravitational and inertial mass. And one way to, um, to measure the Erdős factor is just to drop two things and to see whether they fall with the same acceleration. And here's the acceleration of a body A and the acceleration of a body B. And A and B should be in their composition quite different. For example, the ratio of protons to neutrons should be different. Um, and then you take the difference and you divide by the mean. And that's the Erdős factor. It's a real number. It has two entries, the substance number one and substance number two. And so for certain classes of substances, one tests whether they actually have the same acceleration. And sometimes the substances are chosen such that they fit to certain ideas why they should not fall with the same acceleration. For example, if their ratio of protons to neutrons is quite different. So this is um, the quantity that measures possible violations. And what we want to get is um, lowest upper bounds for this possible violation. Then there's log local Lorentz invariance. And that says basically local non-gravitational experiments exhibit no preferred <coughs> direction in space-time, neither time-like nor space-like. A space-like direction would correspond to an anisotropy of space. Space in this direction has different qualities than space in this direction. A time-like direction would say not all inertial observers are of the same quality. Some observers um, move um, such that you can actually, um, uh, first you can, you can measure an absolute rest frame. For example, it's not so implausible. For example, with respect to the microwave background. We can measure our velocity with respect to the microwave background, a few hundred ki kilometers per second. We see it in the dipole anisotropy of the microwave background. And perhaps that is really a physically preferred rest frame. Why not? Um, and that would correspond to preferred time-like direction. There is also the possibility, which I won't talk about, that it could be a preferred light-like direction. What if there existed an ether? And the ether would blow at you at the velocity of light from a certain direction. Can you test that or not? And it's more difficult. Um, but it's also, in principle, part of this local Lorentz invariance. And one way to encode possible violations would be to look at delta C over C, where delta C is the variation of the forth and back velocity of light in a kind of Michelson-Morley interferometer. So you, lo you, you look for the velocity of light in a certain direction, going forth and back, and then in another direction, forth and back, and you see whether this velocity of light depends on the direction you measure it. And that's the delta C over C. And then there's the universality of gravitational redshift, um, sometimes also called the universality of clock rates, which is a slightly different notion, but okay, universality of gravitational redshift. And this says that standard clocks, which is similar to test bodies, kind of elusive things, but we imagine they to exist, or at least approximately, they're universally affected by the gravitational field. 
That means all stand all good clocks have the property that if you compare their rates um, of ticking, then the only way by which they can differ depends on the gravitational potential and nothing else. In fact, this is um, this is uh, it is slightly more it's slightly more refined than this, but this is one way of putting it. And this can be parametrized by a factor alpha that says that the, the, the variation in frequency over the frequency varies with the potential in a way, if this alpha were zero, in a way that's independent of the clock. It doesn't depend on the clock and it's also independent of where the clock is. It's always given by this formula. There's no space or time dependence in this factor, it's just all residing in here. If it were violated, it could possibly depend on the clock and it could also depend on the space-time point. And then this factor alpha would become important. Now if all these three principles are satisfied, then with some sort of mathematical rigor, it's not a theorem in a mathematical sense, but it's very, very plausible at least, it follows that you can actually geometrize gravity, which is a very, very non-trivial aspect of gravity. That means you can encode gravity in a geometric structure, that as such is not so trivial, it's, it's not so, so um, uh, uh, astonishing. What is astonishing is that all meta components of the world, be it a photon, a neutrino, a baryon, a lepton, whatever, they all see the same geometry. There's not a neutron uh, a geometry and a proton geometry. They all see the very same geometry. It's universal. Gravity acts on all meta component by one and only one geometry. That's the non-trivial statement that follows from the equivalence principle. Um, why could it be violated? What would violate such an such a, such a, um, uh, uh, equivalence principle? Well, suppose for example that next to the gravitational interaction of say the Earth and the body A, they interact gravitationally by this gravitational potential proportional to the product of the masses, inverse proportional to the distances, there were just another scalar force that um, has a very similar structure, coupling constant is now called H, which couples to some kind of charges these um, uh, bodies um, carry. They are called Q rather than M, but it's also inverse proportional to the distance, which means that the exchange particle is a, is a massless scalar um, different from, from, the gravitational, from the gravitational fields. And suppose that these charges are, to, are not universally proportional to the mass. For example, the baryon number could be such a charge. So suppose there were a, um, a fifth force that couples to the baryon number or the lepton number or some linear combinations of these. Then you could write the combined interaction with this as a Newtonian-like gravitational interaction, but now the coupling constant would slightly depend on the ratio, the Q, the smaller Qs, on the ratio of the charges to the masses. And if this ratio of the charge to the mass for all matter in the world is not universally constant, is not the same for all matter components in the world, then you can actually very easily calculate from this that the Eritrash factor of these different bodies would be proportional to some constant, um, which is basically just the ratio of H over G, times the difference between the specific charges. So charge per mass. So if charge per mass is not a universal constant, then these bodies would fall um, in, the, in the field of, of other masses in a way that is not um, uh, in accordance with the universality of free fall. And such scalar fields are predicted, long-ranging scalar fields are predicted in many of the unifying theories, in Kaluza-Klein theories, in string theories and so, on, and so on, though the different models, for example, in string theory, differ in this quantity, in the, in the coupling strength. So um, there is a non-universal coupling of this additional scalar to matter, and so the interaction of all matter components look like a modified gravity law in which the weak equivalence principle is not satisfied. And uh, Damu and Polyakov pointed out in 1994 that some of these models even predict a violation of universality of free fall at a level of the Erdrush factor of 10 to the minus 15. Looks like a small number, but it's not outrageously small. So, and that's, that could 
So there, there are models where these violations are actually <coughs> predicted. Now what is the level of verification of the equivalence principle? So famous experiment in, at Washington University, the group is called Ed Wash, um, between 1994 and um, 2008. They took also torsion pendulums, this purely classical experiment, and for example they took aluminum and platinum, and so it's 10 to the minus 12. They took beryllium, titanium, 10 to the minus 13. And for various reasons they took various components and, and made these measurements. And the improved, the planned improved levels uh, um, is the, the microscope mission, that's a satellite mission, with purely classical test masses in the shape of concentric cylinders and by optical laser devices the relative positions of these two masses are monitored and if they fall with different accelerations or velocities then microscope will detect it up to the level of 10 to the minus 16. Yes? In the previous slide you assumed the one of R potential. Yeah. Nuclear forces mm. have a, I usually describe by U kappa and E yeah. to the minus kappa right. R. Right. Would it be would, would such forces? Depends on the range. Of course, I could have taken a massive scalar, and then I had e to the minus um, mu times r, and then of course this, this um, mixing of this additional <coughs> force would sort of be suppressed at large distances. It would depend on the mass of that particle. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's just assumed that they are, I mean, you can also exclude massive ones if you are in the right range. But that, of course, has also been considered. And many of these, these fields in, in grand unified theories have um, massive sectors, but they also have mass, massless sectors. So for us, it is important that they also predict massless um, uh, such fields. Right, so 10 to the minus 15, 16 is, is within reach. This experiment will start in uh, um, next year. And there's a long planned um, um, satellite test of the equivalence principle which wants to put this to 10 to the minus 18 but for funding reasons this experiment has been um, postponed again and again. So 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13 is the current level of weak equivalence principle and it's expected to be pushed to 10 to the minus 15, 16. The best Michelson Molle experiment with micro cavities is, um, is 10 to the minus 16. Um, uh, but this tests um, only the preferred time-like directions. So uh, whether there's a preferred rest frame, preferred frame effects. So prefer preferred frame effects are excluded up to this order. And far worse than these upper bounds, that means higher upper bounds, are um, given, by, um, given for the universality of gravitational redshift. So this is an old experiment with sounding rockets you actually um, send a rocket up to 10,000 kilometers and you have an H Maser clock in the rocket and on the Earth and you compare their, 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 rage, uh, their, their, their rates. The experiment is called um, gravity probe A and that led to um, um, redshift, um, uh, universality of gravitational redshift upper bounds for violations to 10 to the minus 4 and a more recent one with, with slightly different uh, design 10 to the minus 6. And now comes already an interesting part in the discussion between relativity or gravity and quantum theory. In February 2010, in Nature, in the um, uh, journal Nature, some um, quantum optics people or quantum um, molecular interferometry people claimed that actually they can improve <coughs> this bound by four orders of magnitude without doing a single experiment. Namely, they say this experiment that shows that has actually been done 10 years before. You just need to interpret it properly. And then you see that actually this bound can be pushed down by four orders of magnitude. And the, the physics reason why one should be able to do this is quantum mechanics. And um, I come to this. Let me just, before we discuss this, this is highly controversial. But before I come to this, let me just say what is not controversial. <coughs> not controversial is that the clock accuracy is, in the meantime, so good, or I should say clock stability, rather, is so good that we can measure in the laboratory the gravitational redshift over a distance of, 10, of um, 33 centimeters, that high. Because um, the clocks are based on um, uh, the, 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 best, the best stability of clocks is about 10 to the minus 17 
And um, if you look for the formula of gravitational redshift, have you done this in the, in the lectures? It's something like tutorials. tutorials. Mm -hmm. So the gravitation, the, the redshift of, um, if you have two clocks, one on the table, one on the floor, and you synchronize them, then you put one on the table and you leave the other on the floor, and you wait a little bit, and then you put them back together next to each other, and you read off their, 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 um, their offset. Their offset is something like 10 to the minus 16 seconds per meter. So if one meter higher gives you a delay of one to the minus 16 seconds per second, right? So, and um, from that you see 10 to the minus 17, um, we can do with less than a meter. So that is uncontroversial. Clocks are in the meantime so good that you can compare their rates uh, in the laboratory and see the gravitational redshift effect in the laboratory. Right, so let me go to this to this statement, because that leads us directly into the topic of, of this talk, namely the relation between quantum mechanics and gravity. So this is the experiment. There is a cesium fountain, like in the fountain clock, cesium fountain clock. And there is a beam splitter that coherently splits the beams of cesium atoms by uh, inducing a transition, a hyperfine transition of the ground state and the hyperfine split um, neighboring energy level. So one, roughly, roughly 50, there is an absorption probability of 50%. So with 50% probability, the, um, the laser, the, the photon from the laser will be absorbed. The atom will feel a recoil and will go up slightly higher in the gravitation field than the other uh, component of the wave function of cesium atoms that have not absorbed this, um, this photon. And then by another laser pulse, you sort of reverse the thing and so there is one path of uh, one component of the wave function of those cesium atoms which um, do not initially absorb the photon and the other ones which do. And so there is a difference in height they reach and this difference is 0.12 millimeters. So very close, a tenth of a millimeter they are apart. And now you can actually calculate the, um, the frequency shift, uh, sorry, the phase shift of the, of the um, wave function of the center of mass motion for the cesium atoms that um, occurs because this branch um, or this component goes in, uh, travels through a, a higher gravitational potential than this one. And this can be calculated, that has to do with the, um, the uh, wave number vector of the photon, it's basically the um, delta P over H bar, where delta P is the momentum transfer that is induced by recoil from the laser onto the cesium atom. Um, the time it takes between two laser pulses um, and the gravitational acceleration that the cesium atoms actually suffer in the laboratory. Right? So this is a dimensional, a dimensional quantity and, and that can be calculated from quantum mechanics. An easy way to do this, for example, is by path integral. So it's a nice application of path integral uh, calculations. So that can, can be calculated. This can be measured, this is known, this is, can be measured, but this is not known. The actual gravitational acceleration with this, with, um, of the falling cesium atoms is not known. It can be deduced if you measure that. But, um, and this was the original device. The original device on the original paper was called a quantum mechanical gravitometer a quantum, quantum uh, mechanical device to measure the Earth's um, uh, um, uh, acceleration. But now we want to actually um, uh, not measure the um, gravitational acceleration, we want to measure something else. So we don't take this as being measured. Now, the, according to the um, Newtonian equations of motion, the gravitational acceleration of the cesium atom is proportional to the gravitational field strength of the Earth times the ratio between gravitational mass and inertial mass of the cesium atoms, right? This ratio goes into this relation. But the gravitational field of the Earth is also not directly measurable. You measure it again by taking a reference body and you look at the, at the uh, um, gravitational acceleration of a reference body. And the reference body that was done in the original experiment of 1999, Kasevich and Chu, was a corner cube light reflector made from quartz and monitored by lasers. 
So it's a, it's a reflecting object, microscopic object, that you um, let fall in your laboratory and you monitor its motion by lasers. And that was done. So this um, relation that you just used for the gravitational acceleration of the cesium atom, you just use in a reversed order for the gravitational acceleration of the reference body. Again, you get this factor of the ratio of inertial and gravitational mass now of the reference body in, inverse, in, the, in, in, in the inverse uh, order. And now this is measured. The gravitational acceleration of the reference body is very accurately measured. Um, and all other quantities are measured so that you can actually deduce this ratio. This is the ratio of the gravitational to inertial mass for the cesium atom divided by the same ratio for the reference body. And that's just the Erdwäsch factor. That's the Erdwäsch factor of cesium relative to the reference body. And now we have a device that can measure the Erdwäsch factor for a quantum mechanical system in a spatially entangled state to a macroscopic body. And it would be interesting to see whether they are also the same. And these people claim um, that this Erdwäsch factor has been measured by this experiment up to 10 to the minus 9. Okay. So why is this... Sorry. Th 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 that, is, that is undisputed, that you can actually measure this Erdwäsch factor. But now these people claim you can actually measure more. You can not only measure the Erdwäsch factor, you can also measure the universality of gravitational redshift. And now comes the argument why they think that. And these are the proponents, or the, the, the two famous proponents and opponents in this discussion. Interestingly, they're both Nobel Prize winners of the same year for the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Steve Chu, who was at the time Secretary of Energy in the Obama administration. And this is Cohen Tanuji, Claude Cohen Tanuji. And in this dispute, they take opposite sides. Um, um, Steve Chu says, he's in fact on the paper that I'm talking about, he says, you can measure the universality of gravitational redshift by this experiment. And he says, that's total nonsense. And here's my version of their argument. Why should you be able to measure this? They say, well, from De Broglie, we learned every piece of matter, any piece of energy, has a periodic phenomenon built into it. He, he talks about phen phénomène périodique. Any piece of matter, whatever that shall mean. And that goes by a certain, in fact, it's the Compton frequency that he writes down. And then he says, therefore, it's a clock. And they call it Compton clock. Every piece of matter is a clock that uh, oscillates by the Compton frequency. And that Compton clock suffers gravitational redshift. And since the Compton clock is very fast ticking, so for the cesium atom, it's something like 10 to the 25 hertz. We can very, very accurately measure, the, the, in the language of GR, the, the, the path length in space-time. Because if you, if, you, if you have a tiny, um, if you have um, less than a full period in phase shift, this would mean that we have measured a time difference less than one period, which is 10 to the... Um, uh, to, minus 24 uh, seconds. And so this is the argument. He says, if there is a phase shift, and if the phase shift is according to the uncertainty or the shift in frequency, then the phase shift is delta omega times the time um, my measurement takes to, to, to uh, the, the atoms are in, this, in these different states. According to general relativity, this phase shift is proportional to the difference in gravitation potential over c squared. That's the formula, right? The formula is delta omega over omega is delta u over c squared. So delta omega is omega times delta u over c squared. Delta u, the difference in the potential, just comes about because the atoms are at different heights. So delta u is just g times delta h. But the different height comes about because one of the components gets um, a, a, a momentum transfer from the laser. So if the laser has um, wave number k, then um, the uh, associated um, uh, momentum transfer will be delta p equals h times, delta, uh, times k. So for uh, delta h, 
delta h, you just say it's delta p over m, that's the velocity times the, times the time it takes the experiment. So delta h is equal to delta p over m times t, times t. So there's a t squared now. And this can be brought now into this form. This has now exactly this form. If this prefactor is 1. But what is that prefactor? The prefactor is the frequency of the hypothetical clock that I'm just talking about is exactly the Compton frequency. If the frequency of that clock is ticking at Compton frequency rate, then the gravitational red, the, the redshift of my wave function is just the one that I deduced in the previous slide. And therefore they say, well, it's obvious that this is true. As you know, it's a Compton clock. But De Broglie told us that. And therefore they say, what has actually been measured here, because by this interpretation, this is a gravitational redshift. Um, now, do you believe that? Argument? Is that a good argument? Um, one thing that is very suspicious about this argument, I mean, this argument is 99.9% .9 wrong, I think. But one, one obvious reason why it must be wrong, um, uh, leaving along all the details, is the following. Um, except for the laser interaction points, the cesium atom is in an energy eigenstate. It's either in the ground state or in the hyperfine hyper split state. But it's always in an energy ground state. So from here to here and from here to here, it's in an energy eigenstate. A clock can never be in an energy eigenstate. Nothing moves in an energy eigenstate. It's the whole purpose of a clock to change its state with time. Otherwise, you cannot read off time. So they can't be clocks in the ordinary sense. This does not say that this argument is entirely wrong. It may be that it's just wrongly phrased. Right? But there's certainly no such thing as a Compton clock. It's not that any piece of matter can be used as a readable clock. So that is certainly not true. And one of the challenges that people are now actually taking up in molecular interferometry is to repeat this experiment, but with proper clock states. A clock state is a state that's a superposition of two energies. So that the clock, the, the ray in Hilbert space, rotates in the plane at the, um, at the, uh, uh, with a frequency that's proportional to the difference of the energies. Right? So it's delta E over H. That's the frequency. And so what you want to do is to make this experiment where these components are actually proper clock states rather than energy eigenstates. Um, and so this is, this is a sort of a first, a first hint that there's something difficult about the interpretation of um, um, redshift in quantum mechanics. Here's another one that's also quite, that's in fact last year's uh, discussion in the literature where people pointed out something that's also not so obvious. And you might think for yourself whether you believe this argument or not. Here's the argument. It's, the argument is that there's a remarkable consequence if you put together relativity in quantum mechanics. And the remarkable consequence is any clock in a gravitation field has a, has a, princip a, a, has a limit of accuracy in principle. And the, the very superficial reason is this. If, if you want to um, suppress the uncertainty of the clock reading according to gravitational redshift, you have to localize the clock very accurately. If you don't know where it is in the gravitation field, you don't know at what gravitation level it is, at what gravitation potential. If you don't know at what gravitation potential it sits, you don't know its ticking rate. So you better know exactly where it is. On the other hand, a special relativistic effect is that there is um, uh, a, um, uh, uh, a time dilation according to velocity. So if you want to suppress that, you better um, make the uncertainty in the velocity very small. But you cannot at the same time make the velocity very small and the position very small. Uncertainty in the position. If you want, according to quantum mechanics, if you make one very small, the other gets bigger. So there is a minimum um, where both, the sum of both is sort of optimally suppressed. And how big is that? So if you take the special relativistic time dilation, it's delta t over t, according to special relativity, is proportional to v squared over, v over c squared, 
um, the velocity certainly um, larger than the uncertainty in the velocity. The uncertainty in the velocity is delta p over m. So, um, and this, according to the uncertainty relation, delta p squared is larger than the 1 over q squared, delta q squared. So the uncertainty, according to special relativity and quantum mechanics that goes in, in here, is 1 over delta q, q, uh, delta q squared. Now, the uncertainty, according to general relativity, is delta u over c squared, and delta u is proportional to delta q, the height. So that goes proportional to delta q. This is inverse, inverse quadratically proportional to delta q. Now, if you add them up, quadratically, say, and you minimize them, you get a minimum. And the minimum is this. And the minimum, minimum is, it goes like um, the, the Compton wavelength of, the, of the, the system you're looking at. It must have a set, the mass goes in there. So it's the Compton wavelength of the mass divided by what's called the acceleration radius. Right? C squared over an acceleration has the, um, the um, physical dimension of a radius. It's called the acceleration radius. And that is usually very small. So it's um, 10 to the minus 22 if the acceleration, the if the gravitational field is measured in units of um, the gravitational acceleration on the Earth and if the mass is measured in 100 atomic mass units. Then it's 10 to the minus um, 22. But if you look at a clock, say, on the surface of a neutron star, then it is much less small. It's much bigger. Because the acceleration is much bigger, not only is the neutron star heavier than the Earth, a million times heavier, say, as heavy as the Sun, um, but its radius is much smaller. Instead of being a few thousand kilometers, it's something like 10 kilometers. And so that gives you um, a factor of 10 to the 9, perhaps. And then suddenly, this comes into the, into the same, or below the range of the best accuracy of clocks that we now have. So there is, there are, it is thinkable that, that uh, under certain circumstances that we think are realized in nature, the gravitation field is so high that the principal uncertainty of clocks is, um, is uh, below the value, or above the value, sorry, uh, um, of the uncertainty that we have um, um, uh, from, from the best clocks now. So the current stability bound on optical atomic clocks is something like 10 to the minus 18. So in order to, to get this number right, you have to distinguish between stability and, and accuracy, so this, that is a stability limit. And again, I would like to, to ask you, do you think this, this is a convincing argument or not? I'm not going to tell you. So this is... Um, let me show you one argument more that you have seen a, many times, I guess, and that's from the discussion between Bohr and Einstein, a Gedanken experiment that has been criticized a lot, and there are many, many problematic points about this argument, but it's very similar. And what I want to stress at this point is the logic is interesting. The, the argument was that Einstein thought he could prove that he, you can devise in principle a system that violates the energy time uncertainty. Um, and he says that, well, um, take a box um, with a clock in it and a shutter, and the shutter is um, opened and shut again by this clock, and place it in a gravitation field, and let the clock be adjusted such that the shutter opens a definite time and then goes and then shuts, shuts off again. And inside the box there's a photon, and the photon either escapes or it doesn't escape in the time the shutter opens. And whether it escapes or not, I can weigh, because I know energy weighs. And so um, I can weigh it, but I don't have to weigh it in the moment it escapes. I can weigh it any time after, and I have plenty of time doing this. And so if I adjust the clock to shut to open the shutter in arbitrarily short time. Um, I can take all the time I have later on to weigh the box and decide whether this has, photon has escaped or not. And by that he sh thought he could violate this, this inequality. And Bohr refuted this argument, um, and I think I don't need to go through this, that's a simple argument. Um, but the crucial ingredient in this argument is some version of the equivalence principle because um, he uses 
that when the weighing procedure is in progress and the box is raised and lowered in the gravitational field by the weighing procedure, that will suffer a time uncertainty through this weighing process. And he needs precisely this weighing on this uncertainty in time um, to restore the validity of this equation. So in a sense what Bohr says is to rescue quantum mechanics you need to take into account this principle that's behind this equation, namely the equivalence principle. So in some sense Bohr says um, quantum mechanics needs for its consistency some aspect of, of general relativity. And that's very interesting. So it's just the other way around, right? It's the, the, um, and I think that's an interesting, also psychologically speaking, it's an interesting aspect of this discussion. Um, so this, um, this was an old issue, recent issue, old issue. And I would also want to tell you something about old hopes. There's an old hope that um, sits behind the idea of unifying uh, relativity and, and gravitation. And the old hope um, is that all these divergences that uh, afflict um, quantum field theory um, were supposed to possibly go away naturally um, if you couple the system to gravity because gravity could serve as a self-regulating mechanism to subtract all the infinities of energy. And there's a very simple but very telling um, model calculation which shows how this could work. And this is, the, this is the model calculation. As you know, for example, in quantum field theory, in quantum theory and quantum field theory, the self-energies, for example, point particles are infinite. Even in quantum field theory, the self-energy of the electron comes out to be logarithmically divergent in the radius as the radius goes to zero. So let's, let's do this calculation by taking into account equivalence principle. So take a mass shell, so classically now, a mass shell of radius R, and perhaps it has an initial rest mass, M0. And also give it a gravitational mass, which I don't want to specify at the moment. It's a gravitational mass that may be different from its rest mass. And also give it an electric charge. Then its total energy is the rest mass, then the energy stored in the electrostatic field outside the, the sphere, which is Q squared over 2R in proper units. But there's also a gravitational self-energy that resides in the gravitational field, which is negative because the, char the, the, charge and the, 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 the masses attract each other. So if you disperse everything to infinity, energy level is zero. If you bring them together, you gain energy gravitationally. So the self-energy stored in the uh, gravitational field is negative. And it's this very same structure as the Coulomb term here. It's just gravitational constant times the gravitational mass divided by 2R, the gravitational mass squared. And now use two principles. The total energy equals um, the inertial mass times C squared. That comes from special relativity. And then add on top of this that the inertial mass is actually the gravitational mass of the full system. So the, the gravitating mass that sits here is actually the overall mass. It's all the energy that gravitates, not just a specific component of it. All the energy gravitates. And if you um, include this, then we can just call all the different masses which are equal m, then we get a quadratic equation for m. Here's an m and here's an m, but this is quadratic. And that equation for the quadratic m can be solved by the standard formula for quadratic equations. And you get a solution where the mass um, as a function of the radius of the shell is this expression. So this looks dangerous because there's air uh, in the... Um, in the um, denominator. However, that's cancelled by this R. So, in fact, this has a, has a existing limit as R goes to zero. So now I can compress the, 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 um, the sphere and result in a finite value for its own energy. It's not infinite anymore. And the finiteness of it is precisely come about because of this quadratic term that was added by gravity. And the value, of course, is, is something strange. It's, um, it's um, the fine structure constant comes in here, the absolute charge in values in, in, in units of the elementary charge, and the Planck mass. But, okay, so that's a finite value. Had you attempted 
to make this calculation order by order in perturbation theory in G, you would have found that it diverges at each order. Right? This is a completely divergent expansion in G. By each order it diverges, but the, um, and the reason being that the limit is not uniform in R. So if you, come, if you, if you interchange the limit R goes to zero and, and, and G goes to zero, it doesn't, doesn't commute. Um, but as you see from the analytic, full analytical expression, nothing goes wrong. So the, the finite rest mass exists, even though in perturbation theory you wouldn't have seen it. And that, that sort of ideas of that sort um, um, encourage people to say, ah, if we include gravity, quantum field theory will be in a much, much better shape than it is now. But then there were, there were also voices against this, and they said, well, if you include gravity, all this talk about um, equivalence principle doesn't hold anymore. Quantum theory violates the equivalence principle. There's a famous discussion at a conference in 1957 uh, where Feynman, in fact, raised this point and said, um, it's all nonsense. We know that, um, we know that uh, uh, quantum mechanics violates the equivalence principle. And the example um, that was discussed at this conference was just a, a, a diffraction grating, which was put sort of in a grave, in a, imagine a diffraction grating put horizontally and you sprinkle particles over it, and underneath the, diffra the diffraction grating, there is a, there is a, there is a, um, you see the interference pattern on a screen. And if you sprinkle the particle just over the diffraction grating, then um, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the distances of the, of the, or the, the pattern will depend on the, on the inertial masses of the particles that you, that, you, that you distribute over it, because the De Broglie wavelength <coughs> depends on that. The, the, the velocities that the particles acquire in the gravitation field will not depend on the mass, but the momentum they acquire will depend on the mass, and it's the momentum that makes the De Broglie wavelengths. So looking at the diffraction grating and uh, the, the pattern, you will, actually be table, you will actually be able to tell the mass of the particles that you have been dropping. Um, Another example is, think of the, gravita of the gravitational hydrogen atom. So the hydrogen atom here is just the, think of two systems that attract gravitationally. One has um, um, mass uh, lowercase m, the other has mass capital M. And um, make it very simple, it's just, a, it's just orbital, it's just a, um, um, a, a circle uh, as an orbit. Then you have centrifugal force equals gravitational attraction. But then you say angular momentum must be quantized in uh, um, integer units of h bar. And then um, use this to actually solve this equation for r and eliminate omega. And then you get that the radius as a function of this n is that expression. And the angular frequency is that expression. And what you see is it's not the quotient of inertial mass and gravitational mass that enters. It's, um, here it's the product. And here it's the product of one times the square of the other. And that has sometimes in the past, and even today, been used to say, aha, so um, uh, quantum mechanics actually, in, in quantum mechanics, um, the, the, motion, the motion of two test bodies does depend, after all, on not just the quotient of inertial and gravitational mass, it depends on other aspects. Right? other polynomial functions, for example. And here the energy, you can see the energy also depends, like the frequency, on inertial mass times the gravitational mass. And that, in fact, is just currently tested. Not, of course, with the hydrogen atom, because that would be as large as the, as the solar system if you took elementary particles, but for the ultra-cold neutrons that I've told you at the beginning. So this is the same situation again. It's the airy function that solves the linear potential eigenvalue problem. Um, so you have a hard, a hard mirror on one side and a linear slope on the other side, and you look for the um, energy, energy eigenstates. And here are the formula for the energy eigenstates. Basically, it's just this down here. So that's the airy function. That's the, that's the penetration into the, into the um, regime of um, where the um, potential energy is larger than the kinetic energy, so it's the classically forbidden region, but the wave function will penetrate into the classically forbidden region for some, for some uh, distance. And so the, uh, the eigenvalues of the energies are this, and again you see it depends now on the quotient between the gravitational mass and the inertial mass. 
and so to speak, as we talk, uh, measurements are made in, in um, uh, various places, for example, in, in the Technical University in Vienna, um, to actually measure that quotient from that experiment. However, the, of course, the equivalence principle does not say that you cannot measure mg or mi. It says that if you can measure them, they always come out to be proportional. So there's no contradiction anywhere here against the equivalence principle. However, what does quantum mechanics tell you is that there are nice methods to separate the two. So this formula that I've shown you are nice formula which uh, depend not just on the quotient, they depend on other combinations of these two different masses. And uh, I know that in, uh, in, in March there will be a conference in, uh, in Berlin of the Frühjahrstagung der DPG, the German Physical Society, and this person from, from Hartmut Abele from uh, Technical University in Vienna, he will talk about measurements of uh, um, uh, inertial and gravitational mass of neutrons. So here quantum mechanic is actually a new opportunity. But now, okay, so this is all very different kinds of aspects about equivalence principle. If somebody asks you, you give a quantum mechanics lecture, what do you tell the students? What, what, what happens about the equivalence principle? Is it or is it not true in quantum mechanics? And I think the right answer would be to first say, um, what is the kind of object for which the equivalence principle is proposed in the classical theory? It's a test particle. It's not any particle follows the same trajectory. We know that this is not true. Um, it's test particle. And a test particle is a very sophisticated constru mental construction. Um, what is a test particle? A test particle should satisfy certain... A test particle should not disturb for example, the geometry that you want to test with it. That means it should not be too small, because if it becomes too small, then the gravitational field on its surface is as large as the gravitational field that you actually want to test. In other words, the curvature just outside the particle is of the same order of magnitude or even bigger than the curvature that you actually want to probe. So it should not be too small. But of course it should also not be too large, because if it becomes too large, then the extent of the particle is of the same order of magnitude as the curvature radius of the background, and then you wouldn't be able to actually probe accurately what the curvature of the background is. It should not be spinning, because if it had a spin, the spin would couple to curvature. We know this. And that would make a deviation from the geodesic law. It should not be electrically charged, because a strong electric field on a surface makes strong stresses and energy densities, which again curve space. It should not have um, multiple moments in, an, in its mass distribution, because if it had a quadrupole moment in its mass distribution, for example, again it would couple to curvature, and the geodesic law would not be satisfied. And you can, many, you can list many things it should not, not have. And at the end of the day, you ask yourself, so what's the non-trivial statement that's left? Because the non-trivial statement says something, all test particles fall the same way. So how many different test particles are there that actually satisfy all the criteria that I've just listed? Not many. And certainly a wave packet in quantum mechanics is not a good test particle. It has an extent and the extent can be controlled because it flows, flows around. So the equivalence principle in quantum mechanics can, on the face value of it, first of all, only be stated in terms of, say, homogeneous gravitational fields. And then you would say something like, on a homogeneous gravitational field, or approximately homogeneous gravitational field, the wave function falls like in an accelerating rest frame. In a, sorry, in an accelerating frame. So something like the original Einstein elevator idea. Is that satisfied in quantum mechanics, yes or no? And the answer is yes, it is. And here's the mathematical statement. Um, it's not entirely trivial to show this. It's, um, it's not difficult, and, uh, but it's not, it's not a one-line one um, calculation. So there's the following proposition states, in my opinion, precisely the extent to which the universality of free fall is valid within quantum mechanics. So you consider a particle of mass m in a spatially homogeneous force field f. In fact, this what I'm, the theorem that I'm now telling you um, holds for any uniform force field, whatever the origin of the force is. Um, so if it's a uniform force field, it only depends on time, but not on space. Then the classical trajectories are solutions to this equation. This is just Newton's equation of motion. 
Acceleration equals force divided by mass. Now this can be solved. You can solve for the trajectories of the classical falling sort of dust, if you like. And now you can um, make the following statement. Um, Psi solves the Schrodinger equation um, with force field if and only if another function solves the Schrodinger equation without force field. And the other function um, is given by the original function um, by um, transporting it along the flow field. So this um, uh, phi, capital phi, is the, the flow that's generated by the solutions of this, of this vector equation. In other words, if you, um, if you want to, to know how um, a wave function, according to Schrodinger, falls in a gravitation field, you can say, okay, it falls in the same way as a wave function behaves if, if I, I myself accelerate in an accelerating fr frame of reference and the function evolves in this according to the free Schrodinger equation. There is a non-trivial phase factor coming in which you may be used to perhaps if you, um, for example, know how the, um, the Schrodinger function transforms under Galilei transformations, under inertial um, transformations. It does not transform as a scalar function. The Schrodinger function is not a scalar function on space-time, on X and T, something more complicated. And that is accounted for here by having a sort of complicated phase function. But the quantum mechanical state, the ray, transform exactly as... Um, as you would expect from going from one reference frame to the other one. It's just this composition with the inverse, inverse flow transformation. And in that sense, um, the weak equivalence principle is built into quantum mechanics. Are you referring to the wave function being a section in a line bundle? No, 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 no. That's also true, but no, more complicated than that. Okay. It's, uh, I mean, you might know that the, uh, in fact, the, the, uh, I had some transparencies on this by, um, th there are many ways to look at this. But one way to look at this is to, to look, first of all, look at a proper relativistic equation, the Klein-Gordon equation, and to remember what has the Schrodinger function to do with the Klein-Gordon function. And they differ by a phase factor involving the time. And that <coughs> makes the non-scalar transformation property. What I'm actually, in, in other words, what I'm referring to, it's um, the, the um, under Galilei transformations, for example, the Schrodinger function transforms according to a non-trivial ray representation which is not equivalent to a proper representation. It's a ray representation. And under um, acceleration transformation, It's the same. It's a ray representation. The proposal of Chu was similar to this uh, equation, so the three were, he, he added a phase. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Can one decide mm. with this equation if he's correct or not? No, because it's not so, I, I don't think it's really a question about mathematics. 
this point. It's a question of whether you can... In, that nobody disagrees on the equation delta phi equals that. So this equation has been derived in many ways, and I think everybody believes this equation. The question is whether you should think of this equation, of this delta phi, as being a redshift delta phi, or something. It's, it appears just as a phase shift. But the question is, what interpretation do we give that, right, that phase shift? So I think as far as the derivation of this equation is concerned, everybody agrees that it is a proper equation in quantum mechanics. Right, so, um, so that looks good. How would we go about and ask how do quantum mechanical systems couple to gravity in general? Now here is, here is a way to see how it couples in, in, in the homogeneous gravitation field. It is just according to the equivalence principle as we have learned it sort of in, in undergraduate courses with homogeneous gravitational fields and, and accelerating uh, um, elevators and so on. But how would you go to do it in, in, in general? And that is not an easy question. That is, in fact, a very difficult question. Because initially I said, if somebody gives you a Schrodinger equation, you just take the potential and you take the gravitational potential in it. Right. But we know the gravitational potential is not exhausted by its scalar component. The gravitational potential is more than just the Newtonian potential. It's the metric. So how does the metric enter into the, into the, uh, um, into the uh, Schrodinger equation? And then one way to do it is, is to, to use the principle that you might have learned in this course. It's minimal coupling. Did you mention this on the covariant? Replacing partial derivative by covariant derivatives, replacing the Minkowski metric by the curved space-time metric. Very implicitly, yeah, but yeah, not explicitly. Yeah. Okay. So if you take any sort of matter, how does electromagnetism feel gravity? There's a prescription, how you, how you do this. It's called um, um, minimal coupling. And um, minimal coupling says, take your favorite theory, give it a special relativistic form, replace the Minkowski metric of that special relativistic form by the curved spacetime metric, and replace the ordinary derivatives by covariant derivatives. This is the prescription. So step one would mean, first take your favorite theory and put it into a special relativistic form. Now, if you have a one-particle quantum mechanical system, what is its special relativistic form? quantum field theory, many particle theory, but not one particle theory. So already that step is not easy. And therefore, for some, for some um, sort of situations where people think, okay, actually it's, that it's just the, the classical gravitation field that I want to couple. It's not so much the, the, um, the quantum field theory of the gravitational sector that I'm interested in. It's the quantum field theory sector of my meta that I'm interested in with a classical gravitational field. How I do this? And then people said, okay, a first good guess would be the so-called semi-classical Einstein equations. So it's the Einstein um, tensor on the left-hand side, <coughs> and the, on the right-hand side, it's the energy momentum tensor for the expectation value, perhaps, of a quantum field. And that, harmless as it looks, is a very dangerous procedure, interpre interpretation-wise and also mathematics-wise. If the right-hand side is the expectation value of the quantum field phi in a certain quantum state, then the energy momentum tensor that's on the right-hand side clearly depends on the state because it's the expectation value. If you then solve the Einstein equations, the solution to the Einstein equations, which is the metric, becomes implicitly state-dependent because the right-hand side is state-dependent. But that metric now goes back into the evolution equation for the quantum state. Now, the evolution equation of the quantum state had formerly perhaps been linear, but now, when you feed in the metric in, which depends on the metric, it becomes <coughs> nonlinear. So, this coupling would induce a nonlinearity in your evolution equation for the quantum state. And one version of this, a Mickey Mouse version, if you like, of this, is um, the non-relativistic limit, weak gravitational fields, small velocities um, of that equation. That means that gravity is just described by the scalar potential of the, of the Newtonian gravitational potential, and where the right-hand side becomes the one-particle non-relativistic wave function. So we go to the one-particle sector, we don't have transitions between different particle sectors, and then we essentially get something like the Klein-Gordon equation for the one-particle sector, and of that we take the non-relativistic limit, 
There are many ways to do this, and we get to the Schrödinger equation. And that program can be run, and the result of this is this equation, um, which is the Schrödinger equation, which, an which has an additional potential. And the additional potential is just what you thought it would be, namely, basically, the potential according to a mass distribution, rho, which is basically just a zero, zero component of the energy momentum tensor. It's a zero, zero component divided by C squared. So it's just the meta density of the energy momentum tensor. That's just the first factor. So this is the Newtonian equation for the Newtonian gravitational potential for that mass distribution. But there's another term. And the other term is a term which distributes some meta, sort of meta according to the probability distribution, the probability amplitude squared of that Schrodinger function. As if the Schrodinger function um, <coughs> represented some meta distribution according to the probability density. That's the outcome of that equation. So if for the moment we ignore the first term here, which is the obvious one that we expected, this is just another way to derive from first principles, <coughs> we get another term, the self-coupling of the gravitation field of a meta, um, of, of a meta wave. And um, solving this equation, so inverting the Laplacian by an integral, um, we can actually solve for this V in terms of an integral over psi squared and plug it into this equation and then we get a non-linear, non-local uh, integral differential equation. And this is this one, and it's called the Schrodinger-Newton equation. So this is the Schrodinger equation with the free part, the kinetic part, and this is a self-interaction of the psi fields according to some self-gravitating factor <coughs> that spreads all over space. And that equation is quite interesting. Its derivation is um, plausible in some situations. It has been much, much discussed, um, and many people don't like it. Um, other people think it is interesting to pursue whether this equation has testable consequences in the laboratory. And so it's worth pointing out that this is a perfectly decent equation, even though it's non-local and non-linear. It can be derived from an action principle. It has all the symmetries of the Schrödinger equation. It has a 10-parameter symmetry group, the inhomogeneous Galilei group. It has a nice scaling property. You can derive a new solutions from old by scaling. And uh, many mathematical results about <coughs> these equations are known. It's, not, it's different from other nonlinear Schrödinger equations that people use, for example, for Bose-Einstein condensates, for, for so-called um, 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 also for plasmas, but also for, um, for condensates. Um, this is, the, this is called the gross pitevsky equation, which has a non-linearity, but which is local. This one is non-local. Um, one way to, let me just go back, one way to, to, um, to see under what conditions this prefactor become, uh, this factor becomes important, when does sort of this perturbation of the free Schrodinger equation become important, one trick to, 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 um, to do is to put the Schrodinger equation to a dimensionless form introduce a length scale, introduce accordingly a time scale, introduce a dimensionless uh, space coordinate and a dimensionless time coordinate, and rescale the, uh, the, the Schrodinger function so it's now square integrable, be, uh, now with respect to the um, un rescaled um, uh, uh, x coordinate, then the Schrodinger Newton equation takes this form, <coughs> and now you have um, a prefactor k here, and this prefactor k here is dimensionless, and you want to ask under what condition is that factor close to one, at least not too small. And um, if you, if you um, play around a little bit with it, you see that it can be brought into the form length scale divided by Planck length times the mass parameter that's in this equation divided by Planck mass to the third power. So if this factor is not very small, then this term becomes effective. And this means that if your system, for example, is of the order of a few hundreds of nanometers, typical um, um, grating distances, for example, in experiments like in Vienna, when people do diffraction uh, experiments with molecules or, or, or 
and so on, in the group of uh, Marcus Arn, for example, then you have a few nanometers. So you have wave packets of the width of a few hundred nanometers. And the mass you must have in order to see this factor must then be 10 to the 10 atomic mass units, U, atomic mass units. They have 10 to the 5, 10 to the 5 atomic mass units. They take large molecules and make um, different... Um, uh, coherence experiments with large molecules. For example, if you take fluorofolarena, um, the, the, they have 1,632 or something atomic mass units. So it is, if this equation were correct, then you would see deviations from the free Schrodinger equation according to the self-gravity um, for 100 nanometer wave packets if the mass is 10 to the 10 U. And we are five orders of magnitude away from this. Right. Uh, just uh, co coherence in the last term, but can only be seen at t equal one millikelvin. That's right. Ten nanokelvin. That's right. That's right. Coherence time. The coherence time you would need are very long here. For, it depends very much on the masses, but it would be here very long. That's true. And, and also at very low temperatures. That's right. Yes. Low yes. 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 So that's right. I, I come to this. At, at, uh, the upshot is on Earth, it's very unlikely to be, have an experiment like this, but in space, not. Um, so there is some, some kind of self-gravitating effect of wave functions if you believe the semi-classical equation. This semi-classical equation has other nice properties that I just briefly want to mention, just short um, mention of this. Um, for example, take a free Gaussian wave packet. This is a solution to the free Schrodinger equation, the full glory of the solution of an initial Gaussian state um, for all future times. Um, and now plot the radial, the radial probability distribution, that's psi mod squared times r squared. So the radial probability distribution. This is a global maximum at this value, and you can calculate the acceleration of this global maximum. And um, you can, you can um, compare the, um, the acceleration according to quantum mechanical dis dis dispersion um, and compare this to the self-gravitating inverse pointing acceleration according to its own mass. And you see that um, the um, quantum mechanical dispersion goes like 1 over width to the cubed and the um, gravitational attraction goes like one over the width, roughly the width, um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to the second power. Which means that the, gravi the, the wave packet will, will recombine, but it will never form a delta distribution. Eventually, quantum mechanical dispersion is always stronger because it grows faster with the third power. But then, sort of, the, the quantum mechan mechanical dispersion sets in, and if, 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 it, if the wave packet is sufficiently wide, then the gravitation effect um, comes into the play and, re, and uh, refocuses um, the, 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 this wave packet and leads to apparently decoherences in the, in the ex experiments. And again, you get the same relation from this naive um, uh, picture that the mass cube to the width should be the uh, mass cube to the length scale in, in Planck units. Um, so if this is fulfilled, if, if the mass cubed times A is of that order, then this effect becomes dominant. Um, right. And you can ask, okay, so there will be a, an oscillation phase, there will be a refocusing, and then there will be, um, does the system have actually bound states according to its own gravity? And the answer is yes, it does have uh, uh, bound states. And in fact, you can very naively estimate them. And the estimate is, is uh, you might know these dirty tricks from qu elementary quantum mechanics courses where you can almost exactly judge the Rydberg energies by sort of semi-classical, non-rigorous um, um, back of an envelope calculations where you make some sort of um, uh, energy balance with the kinetic term and the potential term and then you minimize in A and then you... Um, so this, this you get by using the, by using the, the uncertainty principle. 
So P squared over M is something like 1 over M A squared according to the, to, to the uh, uncertainty principle. And then you minimize in A. And you can play the same trick here. And what you get is almost exactly up to a factor 1.6 of the calculated energy ground state. And that an energy ground state exists had been fully analytically proven. So what will happen is there will be a soliton in the end, a Schrodinger Newton soliton, and the rest will be radiated away. And at some stage, Penrose thought that this would be a nice model for the quantum mechanical collapse of the wave function according to gravity. But this picture tells you that it cannot be because the, the, the whole wave function would have to collapse into one localized state. Instead, what happens is part of it will localize here and parts will be radiated away. So it's, it's still these two, one part localized here and the other one, one running away there. So this is why, why the original Penrose idea, I think, doesn't work. Right, um, and I, I also was part of this game at, uh, in, the, in the last few years, and, and we asked ourselves, <laughs> how would that model for a single self-gravitating particle um, actually give rise to observable consequences in those experiments that people, for example, in Vienna do? And... Um, for this, you have to look at a many-particle situation and to derive an effective equation for the center of mass because this is what they observe, the center of mass wave function. It's not they don't observe the center of the each individual particle. So you have to a many-particle equation like this and then deduce an effective equation for the center of mass, which is non-trivial because this is a non-linear equation. So it's not obvious that the center of mass wave function separates from the rest. You cannot separate in the usual way. So the question was how you separate these equations, and that's difficult, and it's only approximately done analytically, but what we could show is that the center of mass obeys a Schrodinger-Newton equation under certain circumstances that can be met. And then you get an equation like this for the center of mass of spheres, for example, and now there are experiments involving these, 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 these spheres. And now I would like to see the movie. There's a short movie just for the you just click it. You see, um, the evolution, right, so this is an evolution of a free wave packet in red and a blue wave packet according to the Schrodinger Newton equation. Now it spreads again. Now comes gravity into play. Now it refocuses again and falls back. And that's the radial probability distribution, whereas the Red one becomes shallower and shallower. The blue one always comes back and forth. And, the, the, and you see the, um, let's see, first of all, it's, um, it's 10 to the 9 mass units. Um, this, is, this is nanometers. This is the, the width in nanometers. And the integration time was almost a day. Right, this is almost a day. So you would, in order to see this, you would have had coherence times of days. But for higher masses, the coherence time goes down with the fifth power of the mass. So it goes down very fast. So if you take higher masses, 10 to the 13, for example, then you have um, significantly less uh, uh, coherence times that you need. Okay, that's almost it. To talk again? Can I see the talk again? Oh, it's, no. <laughs> Just go back to the original file. No, the, 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 this, the, the process that you have just seen okay. takes days, takes a day. So the spreading and refocusing takes a day. No, not the time of coming. No, 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 no. Okay. So this is where we were, and this is this is just a static picture of this. This is just a static picture of this, and you see that. Um, you have 40,000 seconds here for refocusing of this, of this wave function. This is basically just it. And this is also 
um, increasing. This is, this is the, the peak of the wave function. If you have five times 10 to the nine atomic mass units, it spreads. Then it starts to refocus, refocus, refocus. If you increase the masses, then it refocuses and makes this bounces back and forth. And that's just a, what you have seen in the movie. So it's just the same. And that brings me to the conclusion. Um, so what have we learned about quantum gravity? Of course, about quantum gravity proper, we have learned nothing so far. <laughs> um, um, what we have, but there are much easier questions than those, than that um, for quantum gravity that are also not easily answerable. And that's uh, the, the relation between quantum, ordinary quantum mechanics and, and uh, gravity. So one question we could, for example, address, what happens in the unlikely, though not impossible, event that gravity stays classical? Um, how then do quantum systems couple to gravity? What, for example, would be the gravitational field that is created by a spatial, spa, um, but, a, um, but a typical quantum mechanical double slit experiment? If you have two delocalized meta components in your wave function, how do they uh, act as a source for the gravitational field? One question that my colleagues in the, in the, in the laboratories ask is, can we significantly improve, um, improve means to lower the upper bounds on violations of the equivalence principle by using matter in non-classical states? That's what they want to test. So they want to test some sort of quantum equivalence principle, but before you test that, you have to formulate it. So what is the quantum equivalence principle whose possible violations you want to test? And one question I'm interested in is, is there's an army of arguments against fundamental semi-classical gravity, but all these arguments presuppose some sort of validity of the standard mechanical formalisms, including the collapse postulate, um, which itself is sort of, for some at least, problematic. And it's not clear to me how convincing these arguments really are. And therefore, I think it's interesting to look for consequences from semi-classical gravity um, and to test um, whether you can actually see effects that can be tested by center of mass motions. And I talked to um, some people working in this field on the experimental side, um, mostly those in Vienna, Markus Arndt and Markus Aspelmeier and Henrik Ulbricht, um, who also worked in Vienna some time ago and now has his own group in Southampton. And they say to me, um, at least they say it's not altogether ridiculous to propose such experiments. Um, and we made some back of an envelope calculations, how likely it is to see something, and, the, and if progress is as in the last years, then yes, on space platforms, it could be feasible. On Earth, probably not. Because there, usually, integration times are limited by the, f free, by the time for the free flight of the object in... in, in so, for example, in the um, place I come from, in, in Bremen, we have a drop tower, 140 meters high, in, and the dropping height is 110 meters, and we have 4.6 seconds of weightlessness. That's not enough. We need more. The effect goes squared in time. So, if you have significantly longer time, we can um, uh, actually improve closeness. Okay, and that brings me at least to the end of, of the main part of this talk. Thank you.